Father, we just welcome your presence here today. We thank you that you are bigger than all our problems. You're stronger than all our weakness. We thank you that you are doing great and wonderful things all around us every day. And we pray that you give us wisdom and strength and, and enlightenment to be able to see and to know these things and to be able to trust you and walk with you. And we pray that you would help us even now as we take this time to look into your word, that we may be able to see what we can't see and know what we can't know so we can go where we can't go because of the anointing, because of your strength. So, Father, just lead us by your spirit. Be with all who need you today, those who may not be here for various reasons. We pray that the grace of God will be on them and in them and flowing out of them today as they are in the various locations. And we just speak blessing and help, healing, deliverance, and provision into the lives of your people. In Jesus' name, everybody said Amen and amen. Well, for the last little while, we've been in Psalm 103, and um, it is always difficult to be able to finish something like this in uh, a couple of Sundays even. And we're going to see how far we can get today, but we've talked about the goodness of God showing up and David being so excited about it that he, he, he said, Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And all that is within me bless his holy name bless the lord O my soul and forget not all of his benefits and uh you know the benefits that come from god we only know part of them anything good in your life is from god amen every good james said every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And uh, I referred you to a scripture in Psalm 34, and one, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise will continually be on, in my mouth. I will bless the Lord. You know, you can do what you want. God's not going to stop you. You can do anything you want, and you can get yourself in trouble, or you can be good. But David said, I will bless the Lord. So that the, the onus is on us to make a decision, a quality decision, to live our, live our lives praising and blessing God and honoring God with everything we do. Amen? We make that quality decision. And uh, he said, he started to begin, to, uh, we started actually to talk about the benefits that come from knowing God. And there are basically seven major benefits that are mentioned in this psalm, after, after David began to mention how he blessed the Lord, he said, forget not all of his benefits. And we talked about the fact that he forgives all of our sins. How many people have your sins forgiven this morning? Shout, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. How awesome is it to have your sins forgiven, to be righteous, to be able to stand before God, and he sees you as if you had never sinned. I feel sorry for people who can't see that, who can't fathom that, who, who can't be daily thankful for that because, because the blessing of the Lord is so wonderful in our lives, knowing that really outside of what Jesus did on, cro on the cross and, and his resurrection from the dead, outside of that, you and I have no hope for an eternal destiny in heaven. But because of Jesus... We've been blessed with that. He forgives all of our sins and he heals all of our diseases. And that's where we stopped last Sunday. We talked about that a bit. And uh, I'm going to start there and just go on from there today. Uh, one of the basic things that I mentioned to you, and uh, I just want to reiterate, is that you cannot believe God for healing in your physical body until you recognize that it is God's will to heal you. You and I have to have a, our minds made up that it, it is the will of God to heal me. A leper came to Jesus in, I think it was Matthew chapter 8, and uh, he said to Jesus, if, if, if you will, if it's your will, if you're willing, you could heal me. So here's Jesus' opportunity to respond and let all who would ever read this from that moment on 
to today know the truth. He said, I am willing. Be clean. Be whole. And of course, the leper was made whole and clean. And of course, Acts 10, 34, the Word of God says that God is no respecter of persons. So if, if, if miraculous healing and deliverance is coming to, to anyone, uh, God is not going to withhold it from you or from me. It is the will of God for you to be healed. It is the will of God for me to be healed. Whenever something attacks my physical body and I'm dealing with something in my physical body, you will never hear me say, God, why aren't you doing this or why aren't you? God has already paid the price. The thing has been already taken care of. Jesus bore stripes for my healing. He went to the cross so that I could be healed, delivered, spared, encouraged, strengthened. And, and his power is, is available every day of our lives. So when there's, something la- when there's something lacking physically in my body, I ask myself, what do I need to do to change? What am I not doing that I ought to be doing to open the door for the power of God to come in and undo the works of the enemy and establish a healing and a cure within my physical body? Because God's desire is, yes, I will. It is my willing. I want to heal. I mean, you know, uh, when we go into Isaiah chapter 53, the Bible says that we are healed by his stripes. You know, he, he bore stripes for our, our discomfort, our dis-ease, our sicknesses. And even Isaiah looked ahead and said, we're healed by his stripes. In 1 Peter 2.24, Peter looks back and says, by whose stripes ye were healed. This thing is taken care of. This, th- this thing is done. So I intentionally, willfully, purposefully in my own personal life am going after that with everything that is in me. Is there anybody in the house that believes the same way that I do about that? And that's your intention? You see, the Bible emphatically, clearly makes it, uh, speaks to, to us without, without like making it shadowy and, and tells us that the enemy is the one who is, who is oppressing with sickness. The Bible says in Acts 10, 38, how Jesus was anointed by the Spirit of God and he went about doing good, healing all those who were oppressed of God. Some of you read your Bible? Hey, hey, healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. So Jesus was anointed to do good, going about doing good healing, going about doing good healing, going about doing good healing, all those who were oppressed of the devil. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus comes across a woman that is bowed over with a spirit of infirmity for 13 years. And, uh, for 18 years, actually, it's, it's Luke 13, 18 years. <laughs> Thirteen or eighteen, that's too long to be bowed over with a spirit of infirmity. And, uh, you know, it's on the Sabbath day, and, and uh, Jesus decides he's going to heal her. And uh, the scribes and the Pharisees are more concerned about, about, <laughs> about political correctness. No, 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 a religious correctness. But I think the church today is wavering in both gardens, political and religious, and God is usually shut outside. Things haven't changed. It's just, it's just getting worse. It's just getting further and deeper into, into anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-word, anti-spirit, so that the powers of darkness can have their proverbial way in the world and in, and in the activities that are going on in the world. So the scribes and the Pharisees said, no, you can't be doing this on the Sabbath day. And listen to what Jesus said. I could go read the scripture, but you go in that chapter and read it yourself. Listen to what Jesus said. He said, Ought not this woman, who is a daughter of Abraham, be loosed from this infirmity on the Sabbath day? This woman whom Satan hath bound. Like either Jesus had no idea what he was talking about, or the devil 
had bound this woman for 18 years. Now, if you believe God is making you sick, then you're going to have to take it up with him down the road because that won't keep you out of heaven. It'll just shut you down from getting healed. David had that revelation. He said, who forgives all of my iniquities or my sins and heals all of my diseases. What about your God? What do you think about him? What, 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 how do you feel about your God? Well, well, David had no question. I mean, he was, he was not backward about this. He wasn't perfect. He had his mistakes and failures. You know that. I'm not going to go into his failures. But, but when it comes to talking about the goodness of God in his life, he said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. If there's anything inside me that's not ready to bless God, I want to change it or get rid of it. Amen. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not. Listen, you're going to use your memory for anything. Remember the goodness of God in the land of the living. The psalmist said, I would have fainted had I not believed to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. And he said, forget not. Remember the goodness of God. Remember the faithfulness of God. Remember that God is good. It's not enough to sing, you are good, good. Glory to God. I mean, sing it, yes, but if you don't really believe it in your heart... You're only mimicking somebody, something somebody else wrote. Is that a true word? So stir it up in your heart. And Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, believe that God is good. And He wants you well. He wants you whole. He wants you strong. He wants you delivered. And when you realize that, that God is good, the goodness of God, He healeth all of my diseases. When you believe that, then you can start using your faith against the one who actually is trying to destroy you. Jesus said, oh, not this woman whom Satan hath bound. You either got to say that Jesus was an idiot and he didn't know anything he was talking about, or you have to believe that the devil is the one who inflicts with disease and infirmities and, 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 and all those maladies. You had to believe that. How many of you believe the devil is not good and he's the one that makes you sick? The rest of you enjoy the ride. But you know, hey, seriously, we need to believe that God is our healer and he wants us healed. He wants us delivered. And you need to believe daily that healing is working. Working on you. Working in you. The word of God David Ingalls wrote a song, and, and, and we used to sing it sometimes. The word is working mightily in me. The word is working mightily in me. No matter what the circumstance, what I feel or see, the word is working mightily in me. You see, that's a, a little jingle, but I'm telling you something. You need to sing your faith. You need to sing your faith. I thank God for a lot of the wonderful songs. We sang some good stuff here this morning. I was sitting down meditating the other day, and I wrote down a list of stuff. That I, and I'm questioning, do we see this in, our, in, our, in our, uh, our hymn writing, our song writing, our course writing today? You know, how many times do you hear the blood of Jesus mentioned in songs that are written today? It'll be interesting to go down through all the list of them and see if you can find the blood of Jesus. Seriously now, I'm not knocking the songs because some of them are awesome. Everybody say, some songs written today are awesome. You don't even sound like you believe that. But, but, we need to believe that the blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. You ought to sing about that. You ought to sing about being born again. We used to sing, born again, there's really been a change in me. <laughs> Oh, you sing that. When was, that? when was the last time you had a song, heard, got, brought a song in that we were just learning, talking about being born again? Oh, yeah, there's changes coming in, but it's almost like we're afraid to make the declaration of the scriptural truth. We've got to kind of skirt around it and tell the truth, but it's kind of like disguised a bit. I mean, 
when, when, when did you hear a song about repentance? Now, we've been forgiven. But I'm going to tell you something. You're messing around. You need to repent. Amen? When was the last time you, you heard a song written recently about being baptized in the Holy Ghost? Sure, we talk about spiritual experience in the presence of God. But what about being baptized in the Holy Ghost? I've got the Holy Ghost. <laughs> well, we need to sing it, but I could go on list. And, and I'm sure there are some. I just don't see and hear a whole lot of them. We need to sing about faith. We need to sing about healing. And I like I liked the song. It was written kind of like by mistake or, you know, in some kind of way. I believe he's my healer. Sometimes God's got to work around and get a song in that he wants in. And uh, it's good to sing that. When was the last time we heard a song written about deliverance? Because, you see, there's a lot of demonic activity still working in the church today, and people need to be set free from a lot of junk that don't belong to the church. We need to sing about second coming. Amen? Amen? Now, some of these things are being mentioned in, in, in the songs that are being written today, but in a lot of cases, you want to sing about some of that, you've got to go back 100 years and pick up a song and sing it, sing about it. Isn't that the truth? You say, Pastor, that's pretty negative. Uh, no, that's realistic. We have a responsibility to make declaration of our faith in our, in our everyday uh, talk, in our mentality, in our thinking, Forget not all of his benefits and in our singing. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. There's that responsibility. And I believe God's going to stir up some of that stuff again. And we do go through phases where we get, you know, more things, different things emphasized in preaching actually and in songwriting. But I just want to remind you of that, that we need to keep our hearts and our minds and our eyes focused on the truth of the Word of God. And, and we're, we're in a time frame right now where, where everything is being challenged. You see, there was, you know, like, I don't know how many years ago, probably 30 or so years ago, there was a huge challenge against the church to get rid of the blood of Jesus. You know, we can talk about, you know, being cleansed, washed, but don't mention the blood. That's dangerous, brother. Because you don't want to be trampling under feet the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that cost him everything. Is that not the truth? Somebody shout amen. amen. Now, we don't want to get under, them, under bondage or anything, but we do need to keep our eyes open and be alert, be sober, be vigilant, because the enemy is using every kind of angle he can, every kind of way that he can, to, to keep the church from being victorious in the avenues that you have been given for victory. He forgives all of our iniquities. He heals all our diseases. And we need to acknowledge that the enemy, the devil... Satan, old Slewfoot, is the one who is bringing sickness and disease into your body. Now, let me say this before I go on, because we are talking about he heals all of our diseases. I'm not telling you that every sickness and every disease that's in your body is demonic oppression, but I believe that it is from the original oppression of the enemy on humanity, and it just keeps escalating in different ways and coming and attacking our bodies in that way. You understand what I'm talking about? It, it, it is something that's set in motion from an evil source, and it just keeps multiplying, and it keeps working in different ways and avenues. But, but ultimately, he is the underlying problem in everything that attacks your physical body, the enemy. So you can, you can resist the devil when sickness comes. There's nothing wrong with going to see a doctor. Doctors, I don't care if they're saved or lost. And we got some saved doctors, amen. Thank God for that. But saved or lost, they're still a gift of God to the world. Because they're fighting against that, that, that enemy, that in a physical way, they're fighting against the enemy that is trying to destroy your physical body. Do you know the devil hates every human being on the face of the earth? I said the devil hates every human being on the face of the earth because, you see, they were originally created by God in the image of God to be a blessing to God. 
and they're God's creation, he hates you. Even if you, even if you serve the enemy. Now, I'm sure there's nobody here serving him this morning, but we have no idea who we're talking to over the internet. But even if you serve him and you think you're serving the enemy, the devil, faithfully, he still hates you to pieces. He'd like to use you and cast you away as if you, you never existed. Destroy you. The devil hates every human being. And he hates Christians more. He hates people who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ more. He hates you. But let me give you the converse of that. Jesus loves every human being on the face of the earth. Doesn't matter how sinful they are, he loves everybody. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But especially the household of faith. Some of you know your scriptures know that that's a legitimate way to say that. Especially the household of faith. His blessing, his favor, his goodness is available to the household of faith. You need to stay in there and believe and forget not the blessings of God. Forget not that God wants you whole. He wants you well. He wants you delivered from every sickness and every disease. It don't mean you won't be attacked. Because you will. But you need to trust God. I've said this before. I'd rather die and go to heaven thanking God that he's my healer than die and go to heaven murmuring and complaining because I can't see God showing up. Amen. 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 That's just the way I feel about it. You know, the Bible says that is any sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church. Let them anoint them with all. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. Third John verse 2. He said, by the Holy Spirit, I pray, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. God wants us to grab a hold of that and to believe and trust him. You know, they, they'll lay hands, Jesus said, on the sick and they shall recover. We need to start believing this thing Trusting God. And I mean, I've said this before. If you're taking medication from a doctor, from the hospital, you know, thank God. Medication has saved lives. Doctors have saved lives. But if you're a believer, put your faith out front. Lay your hands on the medication you're taking and say, God, I want this medication to bless me. I want it to bless me more than the doctor even thought it could. And any side effects that this thing could cause are going to be minimized because I'm trusting you. Amen? That's using your faith. And, and you know, yeah, well, I don't think we should have done doctors. <laughs> well, you're going to quit going to the bank too? There's a whole lot of stuff. You're going to quit locking your door at night? I trust God for protection. You still lock your door. You know, you, 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 you can, uh, Fred Price wrote, wrote a book one time. It's a good book to read. And the book was entitled Faith, Foolishness, or Presumption. Sometimes we can have more foolishness and presumption than we have faith. Faith brings God right in the middle of your mess and turns your mess into a, a message. Right into the middle of the test and turns your test into a testimony. Amen. And when I think about testimonies, we're going to hear Helen give her testimony. Not right now, unless you want to. <laughs> but she, she had an awesome experience with God when she had surgery a while back, a few months ago. And, uh, and she's going to give her testimony sometime. And, you know, uh, God ministers to his people. He visits his people. And we need, we need to be thankful for that. Forget not. Everybody said, forget not. Yeah. Let's say it the other way. Don't forget. The benefits of serving God. Amen? Amen. 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 The Lord is good. The Lord is good. Thank God for his faithfulness. Matthew 8 and 17 says, Himself took 
our infirmities and bear our sicknesses. Everybody say this after me. Thank you, Lord, for your healing power. I thank you that your healing is working in my body. What the enemy intended to destroy me is going to turn around for blessing. Are you willing to believe that? All right. Now I want you to put your hand on whatever part of your body the devil has told you is a problem right now. You see, it's one thing to say it, another thing to release it. Amen? Put your hand on your body, whatever part of your body that you believe that God can help you with. And we're just going to release our faith. It's going to take just a few seconds to do this. But you can release your faith right now. Don't be, don't be ashamed because you're believing God. We just thank you, Father. Now, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I rebuke sickness and disease and infirmity and command it to back off of God's people, off of his body that are represented here this morning. And I speak healing and a cure to everyone who believes at this moment. And as faith is released, healing comes. Healing comes. And Father, we thank you that the anointing is on doing the work of the enemy and establishing a healing and a cure for the glory of Almighty God. We receive that and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just say, thank you, Lord, for healing my body. And just go ahead and believe it. Go ahead and believe it. You can believe what you want to, so why not believe what you want? Amen? All right. Now, he, I could stay here the rest of the day, but we're just going to go a little further. Just remember, God's will for you is that you be whole, well, completely healed in Jesus' name. And he went a little further, and he said in verse 4, he redeems our life from hell and destruction. He redeems our life from hell and destruction. Thank God that we have been redeemed that we've been saved. Thank God for forgiveness of sins, but there is that, that, that initial changing when you are recreated in your spirit, man, and, and, and you are made ready for eternity. Instead of, instead of destined for destruction, you are destined for blessing. Eternal blessing. Listen. We can't get away from it. We cannot afford, I'll say it this way, we cannot afford to get away from believing that knowing, loving, and serving Jesus Christ gets you ready for eternal bliss. It brings you from darkness to light and from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. You need to know that your sins and iniquities were nailed to His cross. And because of that, You've been redeemed from hell and destruction. Now, most churches will tell you that hell is just metaphoric. And it's not really real. You can believe what you want to believe. But you better not step outside of the word of God. Interesting fact is that Jesus, Jesus talked more about hell than he did heaven. So, <clears throat> I, I want to be redeemed from hell. I want to be purchased back so I don't have to go to hell. And David said he redeems our life from hell and destruction. You don't have to go to hell because Jesus already visited the place and snatched the keys of death and hell from the devil and gave us entrance into heaven. 
Is anybody happy that you're not going to hell here this morning? You see, there is a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. And I don't care how quiet the church gets about that. It won't change it. You can be so dignified that you put God in a place where God is not as justified as you are. But it don't change the facts. The best thing we can do is find out what God's word says. Receive the blessing and the help and the deliverance that comes from it. And tie a knot there and hang on, man, because this thing is cluing up. This thing is getting ready for a culmination. This thing is getting ready to explode. This thing is getting ready to clue up. And if you can't see that today, you are blind. All hell is breaking loose in the earth. Everything the enemy has is being open and unleashed against humanity and against the church. Don't let it bother you too much in the natural. You want to deal with what's happening, attack it in the spirit realm. I don't care what color they paint the sidewalks. You still got to believe God for a miracle to change the hearts of the people that walk over them. Amen? That's the bottom line right there. That's just another sign that we need to be more tenacious about praying. Just another sign that we need to be more determined to believe God to change people's lives. Just another indication that the enemy is running out of time and he's pushing as hard as he can against what's right and against the church and against God's word. But we've been redeemed from hell. Amen? And we don't want to just be redeemed from hell and escape, you know, you know, escape all that, 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 that eternal punishment. We, we don't want to just do that and escape. We want to be able to be influential in helping others to be redeemed from hell and destruction. I believe that with all my heart. That's where the, that's where the emphasis needs to be right now. Remind people that God loves you and he wants to change you. He loves you so much he don't want to leave you in the mess that he found you in. Somebody say amen. In Psalm 40, the psalmist David said, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And he put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many will see it and fear, and they shall trust in the Lord. He brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on a rock to stay. He put a song in my heart today, a song of praise. Hallelujah. That's where that old hymn was written from. Somebody read it and believed it and sang about it. Amen. But you and I need to live it. We need to be totally convinced that the power of God has brought us up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set our feet upon a rock and established our goings. The rock that you've been seated on is the Lord Jesus Christ. He has established your goings. He said, if you trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understandings, He's going to direct your path. When you acknowledge Him, He'll direct your path. Amen? Amen? He establishes your goings. Leads you in a path that's right. You know, we talked earlier about having our sins forgiven. And that redemption from, from hell and destruction is a continuation of what God has done in His mercy towards us. He's given us eternal life. I think it's John 3, 36, Jesus said, he, he, he that believeth on me hath, present tense, eternal life. It's not like you're going to have it. When you believe him and you commit totally to him, that eternal life starts beating within your breast. It stirs up on the inside of you. And you've already, you've already been given that eternal life. He hath eternal life. You're living in a, in a mortal body, but you have eternal existence already. Isn't that awesome? 
we have eternal life. You know, in Revelation chapter 20, verse 14, the Word of God says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. A lot of people don't want to believe that. And they, don't want to, they don't even want to acknowledge that it's in the Bible. But would, wouldn't it be nice to be smart and trust God for redemption from hell and destruction? How simple is that? Just believe. In Luke chapter 10, verse 19, the disciples came back from having an experience where they cast out devils and healed the sick, and they were jumping up and down saying, Jesus, do you know what happened? As if he didn't know. Demons are subject to us. They're supposed to be. Sickness and disease has been healed. It's supposed to be. Miracles happen. They're supposed to happen. So after they, after they quit dancing and shouting and telling Jesus all this stuff, he, he says, notwithstanding, verse 20, in this rejoice not. In other words, don't go jumping all over the place just because somebody gets healed or delivered. It's just supposed to happen. We, we, we need to be trying to change whatever is hindering that from happening. But when it happens, I mean, some people get more excited about a miracle and a healing than they do about getting saved. Get our equilibrium straightened out. I understand. Jesus does too, if, you don't, if you're wondering. But he said, he said, notwithstanding, in this rejoice not. In other words, don't get bent out of shape just because that stuff happens, that the spirits are subject to you. Or we could say demons are subject to you. But rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Everybody shout, my name is written in heaven. That's something to shout about. I said, it's something to shout about. It's something to sing about. It's something to write a song about. My name is written in heaven. Glory to God. My name is written in heaven. Jesus should have known what he's talking about. And he said, that's something to rejoice about. That your name is written in heaven. Now, he had just finished saying... I'm, I'm giving you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. But that's not the most important thing. Your name is written in heaven. You've been, you've been actually brought out of hell and given entrance to heaven. That's what you rejoice about. That's what you rejoice about. And I mean, I'm serious, man. You either believe the word, because if, if you can disqualify the word and say, well, this is not true, this is really shouldn't be here, and I don't, no, I don't believe that, then why in God's creation are you believing that you can be saved at all? If you can, if you can, if you can discredit the word of God and say, well, this is not true, and that's not true, but I'm saved, bless the Lord. <laughs> How do you know? If you don't believe that this book from in the beginning to amen is true, then you got a problem. So you're, 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 you're psych, psychological and, and philosophical idea about the word and your understanding and your reception and perception of the word is, is better than, than what God put in here and it's lasted all these thousands of years and, and, and defied emperors and kings and armies and torrents and, and shut them all down and it's still the best-selling book in the world and, and you got better sense than this? Have a nice life. Because you're in some serious trouble, man. You and I have to make our minds up that I believe that don't understand everything, but He's given us strength and wisdom enough to understand enough to be saved and to be redeemed from hell and destruction. Now, I want to I want to close because I only got the the rest of the day. Uh, 
<laughs> I want to remind you something else here. I believe hell is referring to the eternal punishment, the eternal destiny of those who refuse to believe God. I believe that when he, when he mentioned destruction, that includes hell, but it also includes the attack of the enemy in this life while you're in your physical body. I believe deliverance and, and, and redemption from all the junk the, the devil would like to destroy you with. I believe he wants that. Psalm 91. How many of you like Psalm 91? Psalm 91 talks about that we, you know, we dwell in the secret place of the Most High underneath the shadow of the Almighty. The psalmist said, I will say of the Lord, I will bless the Lord. And I will say of the Lord. You know how to bless the Lord? You know, we say, bless the Lord. Well, how are you blessing? We say, praise the Lord. Well, how do you praise him? When you bless the Lord, you're saying, he's my God. He's the best. We sing some of that. Thank God for that. Amen. He is, he is good and his mercy endures forever. God is awesome. He's great. There's none like my God. That's blessing the Lord. So, you know, it, encouraging, exhorting one another to bless the Lord is awesome, but we need to bless him as well. Now, the psalmist said, he said, I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge. He's my fortress. He's my God and I trust in him. Amen. Amen? That's, 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 that's in the natural man. He, he's given us some safety. He's given us some protection right here on the earth. He, he said, and I won't read the whole psalm, but he said he, said he protects us from, from the arrow that flies by day and the terror by night. Now, I want, you to, I want you to notice something here. Day and night are earth terms. There is no night in heaven. Hello. This is earth terms. He's coming into the earth, our relations in earth, our, our activities in the earth. And he's saying, I, you know, you don't have to be afraid of the arrow by day or the terror by night or, 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 or the, the pestilence, you know, at noonday and all. Noonday is an earth term. So he's coming into the earth situation and he's saying, I'm coming to deliver you. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it's not going to come nigh you because you've made the Lord your dwelling place. You see, it started with he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most. I'm telling you, you and I need to develop our dwelling place. We need to develop our established dwelling in the Lord. Jesus talked about the same thing in John chapter 15. He said, if you abide, if you dwell in me and my word abides, dwells in you, then you can ask what you will and it shall be done. There's that secret place. You know where the secret place the psalmist was talking about? It wasn't some cave or some rock somewhere. It was Christ. He was looking ahead to those who, who hid themselves in the cliff of the rock like Moses talked about. And that was the Lord Jesus Christ when he made himself the rock. He made himself the cliff of the rock. He made himself the shelter in the time of storm. A rock in a weary land. That's where you and I have found the shelter. And we can dwell in that secret place and we can boldly say, I say of the Lord, he's my refuge. And when hell and destruction comes your way and you don't know which way you're going to turn, even if it costs you your life, you can smile while you're dying and say, you know, devil, is that all you got? Because you know where I'm going if I leave here. And I know your end. Hmm. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of whatever comes. Noonday or nighttime, whatever trouble comes, just hold your head up high and say, hallelujah anyway. Yeah, but I don't understand. I don't either. He didn't say, thou shalt understand all of these things. No, he said, believe it. Believe it. You know, I like what the, proverb, the writer of Proverbs said in, in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. I quoted a few minutes ago. He said, don't lean on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. 
and he'll direct your paths. The mercy and the grace of God are available to every one of us here this morning. Every one of you under the sound of my voice, the mercy and the grace of God is available to you to, to strengthen, to heal, to deliver, to protect, to preserve. And I mean, I, I could stay here another half an hour and I could tell you about times when, when the Lord has delivered my life from destruction. Just a couple of Sundays ago, I told you about when I was drifting out of harm, 10 years old, and somebody comes and, and miraculously they show up to, to bring me back from that, that little raft that was about ready to tip over and brings me back and I'm saved. I could tell you about when I was on 176 feet up on the tower and I slipped and fell. My watch happened to hook into one side and I'm dangling 176 feet and I'm preserved. I still don't know how because the watch strap broke, but I still didn't fall. Everybody around me thought I was gone. My father-in-law, my buddy, they, th they thought they, they, they had me rolled off in a millisecond, but I wasn't. I'm still here. Amen. There are other instances I can tell. I could have been dead, should have been dead, but, 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 but the Lord, but the Lord, I said, but the Lord was there. Even when I didn't deserve his protection, the Lord was, even when I should have been ignored and forgotten about and wrote off, he was there to uphold me with the right hand of his countenance. I'll tell you, the Lord is faithful and he redeems your life from hell and destruction. And you and I need to intentionally, purposefully, willfully, every day of our lives, I don't care how hard it gets, just smile and say, you know what, I'm trusting God. Yeah, but do you see what's happening? Do you feel it? I trust in the Lord. I'm totally and completely trusting God because he redeems my life from destruction. Amen. Is there anybody here glad you're saved this morning? Is there anybody in the house, lad, that you bringing, you're bringing, you're bringing your faith, you're bringing your faith out of the church, and you're bringing it into your automobile, you're bringing it into your bedroom, you're bringing it into your bathroom, you're bringing it into your basement, you're bringing it into your garden, you're bringing it into your relationships, you're bringing it into your workplace, you're bringing it into every situation you find yourself in life, and you're smiling and saying, you know what, God is with me and for me, and if God is for me, who can be against me? I win anyhow. I believe that. I believe that. I was raised in church. I went to Sunday school in the back of a pickup truck crying because I didn't want to go. But I was taken there. I'm so glad I was. I remember being in church and playing in church when I thought, what am I doing here? I didn't want to be. But I'm so glad. I'm so glad that somebody had a hold of something that influenced me to be a part of it as well. And that's why I'm here today. Mm -mm. We'll pick up there next time and go on because there's another few things we want to talk about. Is that fair enough? Bow your heads with me. Father, I thank you for forgiving all of our iniquities and healing all of our diseases and for redeeming us from hell and destruction. You are faithful. You are faithful. And we deserve nothing outside of your grace. But thank you for grace that allows us to receive and to walk free. To walk free from the bondage of our lives, our failures, our mistakes. So why wouldn't we give you everything that we have our whole life and honor you with everything we say and everything that we do? Help us to do so. Forgive us for our failures and mistakes and our shortcomings and help us to be strong. Help us to be ready to go on, to go on and trust you like never before. We believe for that. We believe for that and we thank you for it. But we're still bowed before the Lord here. I'm going to ask the musicians to come take their place if they would. If you're here this morning and you're not sure about your experience with God, right now is a wonderful time to say, God, from this moment on, 
It's going to be you first. From this moment on, my life is not going to be the same. My words are not going to be the same. My thoughts are not going to be the same. Everything about me is going to be different. Because I trust you to forgive all my iniquities. I trust you to help me and heal and deliver me from hell and destruction. Thank you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father.